walked into a Las Vegas TV station and gave a remarkable interview. He said that he'd worked out in the Nevada desert at a top secret facility known as Area 51. He said he worked on a highly classified project, reverse engineering recovered alien spacecraft. His story was a worldwide sensation and Area 51 became a household name, synonymous with UFOs, secret projects and little green men. And yet, neither the US government nor its military have ever denied his claims and they still don't officially confirm that Area 51 exists, despite satellite photos proving it does. Many dismiss Bob Lazar as a fantasist, and yet others see him as a whistleblower, exposing a government cover-up of UFOs and alien contact. A once secret air base in the Nevada desert is marking an unofficial anniversary today. <laughs> Area 51 was one of the most secretive places on the planet, but that anonymity vanished forever because of what happened 25 years ago. A controversial electronics whiz told a fantastic tale during a TV interview, and the story still reverberates today. The I team's George Knapp played a part in what became an international sensation. He's here with an update. Uh, setting the stage, Dave, you might not know this, but uh, 25 years ago, a young anchor woman <laughs> named Paula Francis and I were prepping for the five o'clock news when we learned that our scheduled live interview had canceled we placed a call to aviator john lear to ask if he could get a friend of his to fill the spot a guy who reportedly worked out near area 51 and had seen flying saucers out there it sounded outrageous at the time but that interview with bob lazar turned area 51 upside down we coaxed a reluctant lazar into returning to las vegas to talk about it i don't know sometimes i really do regret it regret it and almost I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? My personal opinion, uh, based on comments I've gotten from uh, the Deputy Director for Science and Technology at CIA, would seem to indicate that Bob was perhaps an unwitting participant in a program designed to introduce someone with a technical background to some elements of the UFO research projects going on out at the test site. I have no doubts that Lazar actually was in a place where top secret investigations were going on. I'm not sure about all the details that have emerged from his account, but he certainly gives me the impression that he was actually there. Do I believe Bob Lazar? My answer to that is yes. And heck, it's going on uh, eight years that I've known him. His story has never changed. He wasn't in it for the publicity. He wasn't, surely wasn't in it for the money. He lost everything he had. Uh, I believe he's since, since, totally sincere. As far as I can tell, he's a bright guy who t tells a great tale and who's told it often to people who have not checked on him, who accept the notion that well, the government wiped his slate clean. Basically, I think uh, he had an experience. I think uh, he saw some things that shocked him, was subject to some conditions and experiences that were very unnerving to him and very profound. He said, you would love to see what's what's out there because it's like beyond science fiction he said and I wish I could talk to you about it but I can't and that's as close as he ever got to telling me anything that happened out there you'll find many people who have seen these discs question is where do they come from uh, Bob Lazar may be one of the few people who can tell us that they're from somewhere else 
I've no doubt that there's a relatively small number of people within the intelligence, military intelligence and scientific and technical intelligence community who are aware of what's going on and an even smaller group who are actually organizing top secret research into this phenomenon. There's been an operating airbase out at the location known as Area 51 since the 1950s when it was home to the CIA's top secret SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. Then in the 1970s, it became the test flight center for the F-117 stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber. It's fairly public knowledge that we have a super secret facility uh, in the mountains uh, in northern Nevada uh, referred to as Groom Lake, uh, Area 51 of the uh, Nellis uh, Air Force Base Test Range. Uh, it's also been uh, referred to as, uh, as Dreamland. This is an area that has been known but officially denied for many decades. All of our super secret aircraft uh, have been developed and test flown out in this particular area. So it only makes sense that if you have something as sophisticated as a flying saucer and the related technology to that, that would certainly be one of the prime locations you'd want to go. What you see is an ordinary looking Air Force base. It, it's nothing to write home about, but because the government won't talk about it, everyone wants to see it. The military has never said there are no UFOs. It's never directly denied any of the Area 51 stories. It would have been so simple when these claims came out, these Papoose Lake claims, for the military to simply say, look, we have nothing there. They could take a few reporters to this area and show them nothing there. The military hasn't done it. The military has stonewalled. It has remained silent. And that's the most damning thing that they can do. Area 51 to this day is not acknowledged. That is to say the Air Force does not admit that it exists. This status has been maintained very carefully, particularly in the last few years. The puzzle is that the base has clearly been very active for quite a while and you can see that there are about uh, 700 to 1,000 people traveling from Las Vegas every day. So essentially the bulk of what has gone on there in the last 10 years um, has not emerged from the black. This airplane was, the program was terminated, the airplanes were put in mothballs for 20 years before they admitted the existence of the aircraft. There's programs that they're working on today that are 50 years ahead of anything that you and I can even conceive of, and that we may never, they'll ne may never see the light of day. Would you say it's America's most top secret military base? As far as a as far as an operational test facility, it's probably the most secret test facility in the free world, yes. So there is no question that the facility is there, that the government has said very little in the past about it. Now the real question, I suppose, is are there any flying saucers out there? No one had associated flying saucers with Area 51 until Bob Lazar's interview hit television screens around the world. He said that he worked at an underground facility called S4. The top secret project was codenamed Galileo. They would call at a specific time. For instance, the operator would say, Mr. Lazar, it's now 4.15 a.m. We expect you to be at McCarran Airport at 4.45. 
your plane will be leaving at such and such time. I drive there, check in, board the plane, and the plane would fly out to Groom Lake. It would land there. I'd get off the plane and wait, and there would be a bus to take me and whoever else is going to uh, S4 Papoose Lake, which is about 15 miles south of there. And uh, then I would check in at S4. Tell me about how you felt on your very first trip out. The first trip out there it was uh, it was actually very exciting because it seemed so cloak and dagger to me, especially after I got in the bus with the blacked out windows. I, I kind of thought that was neat. Uh, drove out to the site and then uh, it was checked in, guards walking around with guns and uh, I, I was sure what I was working on was going to be pretty fascinating. He says that within a few days of working out at S4, he was shown an actual flying disc in one of the hangars. When I was brought in by bus, and for the first time, one of the hangar doors, the one on the end, was open. The bus drove up and we stopped there, and at clear as day in the hangar, taking up almost all the hangar, was the disc. Uh, looked like something right out of a science fiction movie. And as I walked in there, I thought, well, this is the new advanced aircraft we've been working on, and this is why people keep seeing flying saucers, because it's ours, and we've just been testing it probably for all these years. And what, what color and size was it? It was a uh, dull stainless steel, pewter gray, very uh, unimpressive color-wise. About 52.8 feet in diameter and about 16 feet high. So was it actually a recovered craft that you were working on, or was it one that um, scientists had built as a mock-up of, of a recovered craft? Well, whether it was recovered, given or what, it was not built as a mock-up. It, it was an alien craft built on another world. There was absolutely no doubt about that. Lazar claims that he was one of only 22 people who had something called majestic clearance to work on the craft itself. The whole aim of the project was to take these craft, or the one in particular that I was working on, and try and duplicate its systems and subsystems with earthly materials. The work that I did basically entailed back engineering the power and propulsion system. And I opted to start with the, uh, the power, the, the reactor that, that ran the craft. I knew immediately if his credentials could be verified, if even part of his story could be verified, it'd be one tremendous expose. George Knapp was a long-standing TV reporter. He'd heard enough of the UFO rumors over the years to appreciate how big a scoop this could be if Lazar was telling the truth. He gave me uh, uh, information about his background, educational background and employment background. I started with, uh, with his claim to have worked at Los Alamos Lab. We went to Los Alamos and uh, got nothing uh, even close to cooperation. Uh, they wouldn't uh, respond to our phone calls. They say we have no information on Bob Lazar. There's nothing in the files. I said, are you sure now? No, nothing in the files. I showed him uh, the, the phone book entry that Bob had kept that said, uh, he was there. I showed him the newspaper article that, that showed that he was there. Basically, uh, Los Alamos Lab um, tried to thwart me at every step. We're completely uncooperative in trying to get information about Bob, and I, and I found that to be the case at every step of the way in trying to verify his background. Thursday, 12.37 p.m. Former NASA mission specialist Bob Exler 
had heard about Area 51 and Groom Lake when he worked on the Apollo and Space Shuttle projects. He was intrigued by Lazar's claims and started to investigate. Uh, I did uh, a variety of research uh, relative to Bob Lazar. I actually met him. Uh, I obtained a copy of his, uh, what they call a W-2 form, which is one of the um, uh, IRS documents associated with, uh, with pay. Uh, his particular form indicated that he worked for the U.S. Department of Naval Intelligence. Um, they informed me that it was a genuine document. It was not something that had been fabricated. There were a variety of numbers, uh, contract numbers and so forth, uh, issued on the document, which I was able to research, again, finding that uh, these were uh, highly classified uh, numbers. In fact, uh, Internal Revenue Service ran into a, a brick wall when it came to trying to track down uh, the actual employer uh, associated with the, with the document. And then again, with the Social Security Administration, we found that Bob Lazar's records had in fact been, been bleached clean. There was nothing there in spite of the fact that the document uh, clearly indicated that uh, Social Security taxes had been taken out of his pay. Not everyone who's researched Bob Lazar believes his claims. Stanton Friedman is one of the most respected authors in the UFO field today. He's a former nuclear physicist with top secret clearance and has many friends and contacts in the Black Project world. I've looked at considerable depth into Bob Lazar's claims, both about himself and about propulsion systems. Those are fairly elaborate claims. I've talked to the schools that he claims to have received degrees from. I've checked on his high school record. I talked to Los Alamos lab where he was supposedly a scientist and so forth. I have come up totally empty. Now when a guy lies like that, you get very wary. And you know, it has all the trimmings, his story, of a Walter Mitty story somebody in his imagination was, you know, stronger, brighter, faster than anybody else. I don't doubt that he did some work at Los Alamos and other places. He's clever. He drives a jet-powered car, fixes radiation detectors. So he may have performed some service, but I can find no reason to think that he worked out there on a flying saucer. I mean, I had to wonder whether this guy was making this stuff up, but then I see the phone book and I see the newspaper article and I talk to people who worked with Bob at the lab and who said, in fact, that he did work on classified projects, yet no one can find any records of his background. The people that I worked with, colleagues, the people I went to school with, obviously knew I was there, uh, and people at Los Alamos, I was friends with and people that worked under me and alongside of me knew I was there and, you know, cooperate what was going on, but, um, you know, officially, it's very difficult to get information for the people in charge. To further prove his claims, Lazar agreed to take a polygraph test, which he passed. The thing that uh, is interesting about polygraph is that if you're embellishing or if you don't completely believe what you're saying, it is very, very easy to detect. Uh, all it really will tell you is that the individual believes with 100% conviction that what he's reporting is exactly as he recalls and as he believes it to be. And that clearly was the case with Bob Lazar. Now, could his perception have been a, a bit askew? Yes, that's possible. But he clearly wasn't lying. I think Bob is even open to the possibility that perhaps he had been used in some sort of misinformation or disinformation campaign. I mean, look at him. He has a pirate flag floating on his house. He races jet cars. He likes uh, fast women. He likes guns. Um, he w he's technically capable, so in that sense, he may be perfect for this kind of a program, technically capable, scientifically knowledgeable, and yet 
uh, completely discreditable at a, at a moment's notice. If you wanted to uh, test public reaction to a story about Area 51 and then suddenly discredit it afterwards, Bob may have been the most qualified person in the country. Lazar says that on one occasion, he was escorted into the flying disc that he saw in the hangar to analyze its propulsion system. It was obviously made uh, to be piloted by something smaller than the average human being, uh, very cramped in there. Um, what were the size of these seats that were in there? The seats were very small, I'd say about one-third to one-fourth the size of a normal human seat. A lot of people, a lot of people say, boy, it must have been exciting to go in there, and I, and I always say it, it wasn't. It was a very ominous feeling. It, um, I know it sounds silly, but it, it, it's so unearthly in there. You have spoken to someone who's actually seen um, a UFO under a tarpaulin at Area 51. I have. Uh, I've, I've spoken to several people who've seen UFOs or disc-shaped craft out there. There was, a, there was a woman who was a secretary for a major defense contractor at the Nevada test site who worked on nuclear programs who told me that she had sat in on, on uh, conversations between military and civilian contractors at which the Roswell case had been discussed, at which it had been discussed taking some Roswell material to Area 51. Uh, the level of secrecy during those meetings was great. Afterward, they'd take the, the ribbons out of the typewriters she was typing on. She was ready to tell me about this, and I had this conversation with her on the phone. The next day after this conversation takes place, she's visited by two men who say that they work for the company she used to work for, reminding her that she is still under a security oath, told her, we know that you do a lot of traveling back and forth, a lot of long drives between Las Vegas and L.A. We'd hate for something to happen to you or your family. No interview. I mean, it happened again and again and again. Same scenario. Lazar says that in addition to being shown inside the disc, he actually saw it take off from the lake bed. I was brought into the hangar for one of the short duration tests and the craft was already outside on the lake bed and that was uh, pretty much of a marvelous sight. It's a huge thing. It, uh, it's like seeing a house lift off the ground. You, you can't imagine the energy involved to do that. Because of the uh, extremely high energy output and the fact that the outside of the craft does is used as a conductor, that does ionize the air. And the crafts do, as a byproduct of this, glow at night, uh, much like a fluorescent tube will light up. So, you know, bright, strange jumping lights in the sky, that, that does explain that. Would you categorically say there is no way that, that humans could have built the craft that you saw? Absolutely, I will categorically deny that, well, I don't know, how exactly should I put that? I guess I can just say it straight out. There is, there is no way that any government on this earth could produce that craft, period. And I defy anyone to argue that point. One of the big questions that's hung over this whole story is whether Lazar saw a man-made flying disc and not an alien spacecraft. A lot of these craft which are being developed in secrecy in, in the United States are tested at night. And one can imagine that 
seen through kind of half-closed eyes, something like an F-117 stealth fighter or a B-2 bomber, side-on or front-on, would look remarkably like, say, a flying saucer or a UFO. You see an F-117 or you see tacit blue um, or you see uh, a B-2. Particularly if you see it from some fairly unusual angle, you're going to have a very hard time relating that to conventional aircraft. Um, some of these things can look very strange indeed. Um, so, you know, an unusual but decidedly terrestrial aircraft um, can certainly present the appearance of a disc from many angles. I think for anyone who's, who's been out into the Western United States and seen the kind of place it is and let their imaginations run right a bit, it is possible to imagine in, its, in these vast test areas technologies which are highly exotic, highly uh, revolutionary and would change the way we feel about science today. However, to say that that is alien science derived from beyond this world, I think is something which is just, it is unbelievable. It's too much to, uh, to absorb. Do you think that some of the truth certainly lies out there in the middle of the Nevada desert at Groom Lake? I would expect that some of the truth may very well lie out in the desert near Groom Lake. It's the right place for some of it to be. It's isolated, it's under control, it's high security. I don't think we've yet scratched the surface on what's happening out there with regard to flying saucers. According to Lazar, the craft that they were secretly testing out in the desert at night used an exotic anti-gravity propulsion system. The reactor itself was an incredibly advanced system. This is, uh, was an antimatter reactor. This is something we could only dream of having, something that could without huge amounts of power that rivals several nuclear power plants running at capacity. What happens is a great gravity distortion is created, and you're essentially bending space toward the craft. The craft becomes part of that space, and then when the reactors, or when the gravity amplifiers are shut down, the craft is essentially where it was focused. It's a very difficult thing to grasp. It happens virtually instantaneously because of the fact that gravity distorts time. And if you're bending space and time along with it, when you wind back up in that place, you're there between the ticks of a clock. Looking at uh, nighttime video films out in the uh, uh, test site area, we've seen video of craft that were uh, luminous that would move across the sky as if it was uh, skipping a stone across water or, or sort of a sewing machine effect. What we see across the screen are a series of uh, lights, of dashes of light uh, as the object moves from point A to point B. 
therefore we are seeing uh, what you might call a shadow effect of the propulsion mechanism. The only person who's come forward and claimed to have worked out at the base on flying discs. Former US Marines test pilot Bill Uhouse worked out at Groom Lake and other top secret locations for more than 40 years, working for the Pentagon and civilian contractors on a variety of highly classified projects, including, he says, a flying disc recovered from a crash in Kingman, Arizona in May 1953. He said that he'd been cleared to do this interview and to discuss certain information, but asked us not to show his face. What were you actually working on out there? One of the things I worked on was a, a flying disc simulator. It was designed in New Mexico by a, a separate staff that uh, built it uh, in parallel with the actual craft that they were had intended to fly. The purpose of the simulator was to train pilots to, uh, to fly this strange, uh, strange looking craft. The simulator was a 10 meter round uh, disc. The skin was made of uh, boron uh, composite material, not unlike uh, that you see on the F-117. How did you know how to build the simulator? There essentially there weren't any plans. The plans were generated as we constructed it. And it was a, there was a process there that, that took quite a while for, for us to even understand the concept way back in the 50s. Uhouse says that Lazar did work at Area 51. I think Bob is saying exactly what he knows. And I know a little bit about Bob. Uh, from a different standpoint than a lot of the people know and what's been written about him, but uh, uh, Bob Lazar is not lying as far as uh, his place and position and the activity he was involved with at the time, although some of it, you know, he couldn't recall, but there's a lot of reasons why Bob was hired, number one. You know, here's the thing. Take a guy like Bob, send him out there, you know, somebody said, you know, aliens, blah, 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 blah. You know, all of a sudden you're thinking about nine alien crafts. You know, they may have not been nine alien crafts. Bravo 70, 14, contact departure today. Do you believe that the government has recovered alien spacecraft? I have no doubts whatsoever that the United States has actually recovered a number of extraterrestrial vehicles. And what do they do with them? I think that since 1947, there have been efforts to try and duplicate the technology, what is referred to as reverse engineering. And I don't know how far they've got, but some reports indicate that we've actually been test flying within a limited area, actual alien vehicles or terrestrial vehicles, United States vehicles, which have been made using alien technology. Could these not just be military aircraft? Well, I think it's quite possible some of them are military aircraft, I've heard from very reliable sources, including a leading specialist on unmanned aerial vehicles, that we have developed some disc-shaped platforms for aerial reconnaissance, some quite small, maybe some larger, which are being utilized by the Americans and have been built by the Americans. That's 638, 9 double, Las Vegas Star, runway 1 on the left, action, evolution and old traffic crossing downfield. Thank you, sir. Eight, nine, nine, nine. Was it a, a hard secret to keep? It was a vir virtually impossible secret to keep. 
But I did play by the rules, and uh, it caused a lot of problems. It caused problems in my family life. Uh, I mean, imagine being married at the time, and uh, you know, you get a call, you know, perhaps at night, and uh, a strange voice on the phone. Okay, you disappear. You can't tell your wife who it was on the phone, where you're going, and you come back, you know, sometime early in the morning. I mean, what is she going to think? Unaware of where he was going every day and being absent from home for long periods, Bob's relationship with his wife had deteriorated badly. This was seen as a potential security risk out at the base. My wife was having an affair with someone else, so they viewed that as a potential emotional instability and they no longer wanted me coming out until things were cleared up either for it you know it, it to break up or heal or whatever but they uh, that's what to put the brakes on everything there and did they then stop calling you did you get very frustrated about that yeah then I began to wonder boy now they've given me all this information and everything's come to a dead stop what's going on and uh, that's when I began to be concerned and then uh, that's when I began said you know it's now it's becoming important that some other people know what was going on as the silence turned from days to weeks he finally decided to tell his wife and closest friends just what he'd been doing were you aware of the security implications I was quite aware of what could happen but I was also aware that uh, these guys would go to any extent to keep their secret and certainly not have someone that was on the inside running around and uh, I didn't think it was beyond them at all to make me disappear whether I mean who knows I know it sounds more like a movie but uh, uh, I didn't think it was beyond their capability to, to kill me just to stop the uh, the word from getting out Bob knew the test flight schedule for the discs and took his wife, his best friend, Jean Huff, and another friend, John Lear, out to the desert near the base on a Wednesday night in March 1989. Huh, it started coming in, too. Can that thing pick up stuff uh, if it's like overhead, like up in the air? Overhead, 300 miles. Oh, so it could be anyone of these guys. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Well, that sounds military to me. Yeah, yeah. I bet you that's you that's what this know. is. We got. Oh. You see that? Whoa. Yeah. What was that? Did you see that light just come on over yeah, there? That just I was looking right at it. Yeah. Hey, let me check it out. No, there's a steady light. No, it's a steady it's light that just came on. Any kind of, uh... No, this one right over the range here. It oh. wasn't there, and then I was looking right yeah. there, and it blinked okay. on. It's very bright. That's brighter than a star. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, Doesn't look really like landing lights. Interesting. Okay, just change course. Oh. White light? Yeah. Yeah, he's coming at us. What did you see when you were out there? Shortly after the flight time that I had recorded, um, uh, white light came up. Well, not a white light. It was actually more of an amber light. Uh, came up off the ground and hovered and then be do, uh, began doing radical step maneuvers and darting from one side of the sky to the other, doing, doing some impossible flight characteristics. Do you think what you saw over the desert that night was an alien spacecraft? Could I identify it as an ET craft without Bob's help? No, it would have been a, and you know, like I said, an elliptically shaped saucer doing, you know, uh, 
just doing moves that we're not capable of, but I could not say that, no, this wasn't some advanced Earth technology. I guess the mod's clear now, sir. We figured out what the problem is, and whatever that heading is, we're ready for it. That would be a UFO. It's not blinking. It's not conforming to any sort of FAA lighting regulations, and there you're looking at it. That's like a typical UFO. If it was red, it would be real typical because that's what most people report, is red lights like that that are solid colored. I don't think that's landing lights because it's curved already and we're still looking at it. Looks like he's curving back. Here he comes. That is a typical military UFO. There you go. This small group went back to see two more Wednesday night flight tests, but on the third trip, they were spotted, caught, and arrested. Bob was taken to Indian Springs Air Force Base and interrogated. That interrogation was about as intense as you can possibly get, right stopping short of shooting me in the head. What were they saying to you? Everything up to and including that, you know, we can absolutely kill you right now and there'd be no one looking for you at all. And I mean, they, they, uh, everything. They threatened my wife. They threatened to kill my wife. They, they'd stop. They said they'd stop at nothing. They said they thought they made that very clear. They couldn't believe that I had taken anyone out there to show them that, much less left with information like the uh, flight test data and uh, wanted to know what else I had said, who else I had told specifically. They were, uh, they were crazy, they really were. They were completely out of control. After this interrogation at Indian Springs Air Force Base, Bob says that he was put under constant surveillance by security personnel. His phones were tapped, his movements were monitored, and he often found his car followed by military helicopters. Worried about what might happen to him and angry about how he was being treated, he decided to hit back and approached a local TV station about an interview. I thought if I did an interview in silhouette, it would be kind of pushing back a bit. Uh, we're going to say, you guys stop, and not saying too much, but just saying enough just to, to let them know that hey, I'm pushing back a bit and then lay off or, you know, it's going to get worse. It was really the only thing I could do. Did you get any calls from the military or from former workers to say, what the hell are you doing? Right after the interview aired, Dennis Mariani, who was my supervisor, called and you know, all he said was, do you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And that was the end of the phone call. Um, that was the last, well, or at least second to last communication I had with him. And, um, you know, then I decided, well, you know, that's it. And uh, really just said everything that I had seen and done and just wanted to divorce the entire situation. Even now, more than 20 years later, the jury is still out on Bob Lazar and his claims about his work out at Groom Lake. It's a fascinating story which he's stuck to for more than two decades. And although many dismiss it as pure fantasy, the fact is that some of his credentials did check out. In addition, his former employers and even the tax authorities were caught covering up and refusing to release information on him. Why would they do that unless there was something to hide? One thing is for certain, if he is telling the truth, then we're all in for some shocking revelations in the decades to come. Is the government ever going to say, you know, we've been lying to you for 40 or 50 years? Not a chance. I believe they'd stage an event that is much more like what they do. They'll take a big cargo plane or C-130 or something, take one of the old discs that they've uh, 
you know, analyzed time and time again or and finished with, go up to a high altitude and push it out the back and then go fly away and say, oh, look, the first disc has crashed. You know, here's a flying saucer. I mean, I, I can almost guarantee you that's, that's the route they'd take. Certainly there are a lot of questions about Bob's background that have not been satisfactorily answered. But there's too much that Bob knows, I think, that couldn't be explained any other way. Uh, he knows about the layout of the base. Um, he know, knew about people who were involved in security checks. He knew when and where the test flights were going to take place because he took people out there three weeks in a row and they videotaped the tests. How did he know this stuff if he, in fact, did not have some kind of inside knowledge? Do you think he'd make a good uh, conduit of information? I mean, essentially a patsy. Yes, I do. I think it's quite likely that Lazar was set up perhaps to knowing that he would give out this, this information. It's likely to be a very long time before we discover uh, what is actually being done out of Groom Lake now. They seem to wait anything from 15 to 20 years or more uh, after something has been retired before they acknowledge its existence. This airplane was built, designed, almost 40 years ago. 40 years before that, the hottest thing flying was a Seversky P-35. 40 years before that, it was a balloon. So the technology, technology has not stood still. So it's a very good possibility that we are looking at man-made transportation for the 21st century. Uh, it's, it's been so hopelessly polluted uh, that I, I'm not sure we'll ever, we will ever get to the bottom of this story, and, and that's sad. I, I suspect that whatever was out there, discs, alien or not, um, had now been moved to some other location, and we may never find them again. There might have been reason 40 years ago to believe that people couldn't handle uh, the idea of alien visitation. I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, I think we're far more sophisticated now. Do you regret having screwed up at S4 and taking your friends there and blowing your security cover because you s could still be working on UFOs today? Uh, yes and no. Yes, I, at times I'd like to uh, be able to go back in time and and played along with the game and not have done anything and and perhaps to this day still be working on them because I did feel privileged and it was fascinating work once you can get around all the uh, you know oppressive military security uh, and you know maybe we would have stumbled on something and uh, yeah it would have been fascinating. Um, the craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left, to the right, and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. However, that was an extremely impressive test. Uh, Maybe to someone that really knows little about science or anything, that, that wouldn't be a whole lot. But you have to realize this craft was about 52 feet in diameter. I don't know exactly how much it weighed, but it weighed a lot. And uh, this was quite, quite a scientific feat, to lift something completely silently, under control, and uh, you know, perform a maneuver like that. The craft itself was, uh, I assume it was metal. It was cold to the touch. That's why I say it was metal. But it was a uh, brushed aluminum, actually just an unfinished stainless steel, not shiny uh, finish to it. Had no seams. It was as if it was injection molded from one giant die. I was completely amazed. I, I can't really reflect on how it made me feel, but it, that was exciting. How would you define gravity? Could you describe in layman's terms its basic principles for us? Gravity is something difficult to explain because it's something 
that we essentially don't understand. It's just something that we can observe. Not much is really known about gravity. Uh, there are many theories about it, but they are just mainly theories. There's theories of gravitons, which allege that there, these are these subatomic particles that, that act like an attractive force like gravity that exchange between two pieces of matter. There is also a theory that gravity is uh, a form of wave, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, but basically, gravity is a force. It's, uh, it's, it's the attraction. It, well, it's the inherent property of matter to have gravity, a mutual attraction for each other. And that's it, it's basically all that we really know. Modern science, current science right now, identifies one gravity. It's one force in nature. Uh, apparently, through research it has for, or information gained from one of the crafts they were researching there, uh, it, it appears that there are two different forms of gravity. One form works on an atomic scale, on subatomic particles, holding pieces of matter, holding atoms themselves together. Uh, another works on a larger scale, the scale we're most, most familiar with, uh, holding planets in orbit holding ourselves to the ground, things of that sort. Because it produces a gravitational field, it, I, I wouldn't say the craft is invisible during the day. However, if you're under the craft, because of the way the gravity is being used, gravity bends time and space, and it, it bends light. If you are looking underneath the craft or from certain vantage points, you will actually see what's above the craft. It's, a, it's really a trick of the way light bends under the influence of gravity. For instance, we can see stars that are behind the sun, that are blocked from our view by the sun. The reason we can see them is because the sun is a tremendous gravitational field and it's bending the light around it where we can see the star. Space, time, and gravity are all essentially interrelated. They all act on one another. Gravity bends space Gravity also distorts time. When you vary one, you essentially vary the other two. Uh, if you, as an example, if you have a massive body, say a planet or, or something that's making a lot of gravity, producing a lot of gravitational waves, if you will, um, it distorts space. It bends space to it. It also slows down time. These things aren't theories. We know them to be true. Uh, we cannot artificially create this because we can't create gravity. Uh, but this is how they're all interrelated. His burden made him with traveling at the speed of light. There are several problems traveling at the speed of light. Uh, just a couple of them are the fact that as your speed increases, so does your mass proportionally. Uh, in other words, the more energy you put in to go faster, begins to slow you down by the fact that it's converted into mass. Um, you have other problems like just traveling at such an extreme velocity, navigational problems, the fact that you might run into little tiny micrometeorites uh, at, at speeds like this, they would undoubtedly destroy your craft. There's just a, a, a whole host of problems that you're going to run into. Uh, just attempting to do something like that. Aside from the fact the amount of energy required to accelerate to the speed of light is uh, horrendous. Could you briefly describe Project Looking Glass and Project Sidekick for us? Project Sidekick was another project going on uh, with Galileo. Galileo was the project that I was involved in. Sidekick dealt with any of the weapon potential of the craft, whether or not the craft had a weapon in it or could it be used as a weapon, but it had something to do with some sort of particle beam uh, configuration where the gravity generator can be used as a lens to focus, focus a weapon of some sort, similar to the SDI device we were working on in the, uh, the 80s, but with the potential of a focusing device using the uh, gravity generator. And Project Looking Glass? Project Looking Glass dealt with the distortion, the fact that there's a time distortion. Essentially, looking back in time, and by that I do not mean looking back years ago to see the wagon train days. They're looking for distortions that are milliseconds in time. And what, what that was used for, I, I don't know. But that was uh, just observing the time, the, you know, the time distortion, time dilation phenomena, the craft in operation. What is element 115? 
Is it found here on Earth, or is it strictly an extraterrestrial material? 115 is strictly an extraterrestrial material. Uh, it probably occurs naturally in some other places, maybe other star systems. Uh, you know, some people not familiar with science or chemistry say, well, that's ridiculous. All the elements occur on Earth, you know. Uh, but that's not true. There are elements on the periodic chart that aren't found on Earth. I believe the heavy ion research lab in Darmstadt, Germany, uh, has reached element 112 recently. So 115 isn't, isn't that far away. And when they synthesize it, it's not like they're making a, a couple ounces of it. They're talking about one or two atoms of it. To make any usable quantity of a heavy element like that is virtually impossible. Element 115 is in the top of the reactor. And the base of the reactor apparently is a small, something similar to a cyclotron. It's a particle accelerator. Uh, a particle is accelerated to high speed and then deflected up a small tube, and it's aimed at the 115. This transmutes the 115, uh, similar to the way we, we do that in a normal particle accelerator. Uh, this causes a, a reaction, a radiation emission that we really haven't seen before. Um, it produces antimatter. This antimatter is guided down a tuned tube and reacts with a gas. When matter and antimatter react, they convert to 100% energy. This energy is converted, heat energy, is converted to electrical power in the reactor itself. This is done through a, a thermoelectric converter. And this electrical power is used to power other subsystems on the craft, though there is no wiring, you know, as we would know it. Uh, also, that's almost a byproduct of the reactor. The reactor also sets up a gravitational wave from the 115 being bombarded. This gravitational wave was present at the top of the reactor and is essentially guided in the same way microwaves are guided through tuned tubes. And uh, this goes to their amplifying cavities and through the projectors that are in the bottom of the craft. With the gravity generators running, is there thermal radiation danger to the crew? There is no thermal radiation while the reactor is running. The thermionic generator is 100% efficient, which is in violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But in fact, it works. Element 115 is stable. And for those familiar with chemistry, we know that uh, elements with higher atomic numbers have shorter and shorter half-lives. Um, however, when you reach a certain point, they call it the island of stability. There is a place, and we've theorized this for a long time, somewhere around 114 to 116, there should be an area in there where the nucleus of the atom is geometrically stable with protons and neutrons, where it, it no longer decays. It's not radioactive. 115 is, in fact, this element. In fact, it does occur again somewhere around element 247. Uh, of course, you know, we're nowhere near synthesizing that. We can only you know, predict things like that. But uh, that's, that's where 115 is. Did they, the aliens, give us element 115 in large quantities? Whether or not it was given to us I, I can't answer that question. However, I was told that we have 500 pounds by one of my coworkers. Uh, how it was obtained and you know where exactly it came from, I don't know. Whether it came in one of the crafts or you know it was separate cargo somewhere, you know, anyone can speculate. But I was I was told that was the the figure. You were able to get away with a sample of Element 115. How much did you get away with? No comment. Several nighttime test flights, unofficially, while off the base. What did you see? The test flights I saw off the base, actually the, the best test flight was witnessed by my friends, who I had brought out there. I, at the uh, exact moment the craft was hopping around and doing some really impressive maneuvers, I had turned around and I think was uh, looking for the video camera or, or something to that effect. 
but I missed some of the most uh, impressive maneuvers. But the craft was uh, similar to what was done before that I had seen close up, other than the fact that it went above the mountain range, uh, moved a, a much greater distance at a much higher rate of speed. How were you able to find out about the test flight schedules? The test flight schedules were told to me, uh, specifically because I was probably going to have to be present during those times. And at that time, the test flights were taking place on Wednesday nights. And from what they said, that was because that was uh, statistically the least amount of traffic in the area. And that's uh, all that they were concerned about. Does the propulsion system release any sort of discharge or exhaust? There was a high voltage discharge on the bottom of the craft, but uh, as far as there being an exhaust, there was none. Why did they appear as glowing balls of light in the night sky? Well, that's kind of the same reason why a neon light or a fluorescent light lights up. What you're dealing with, with is a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. And uh, I don't think it's anything, it, it's a really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light. The same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge, and the gas emits light in the form of lightning bolt. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or uh, just a bright light in the sky from a distance, uh, even close up you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. Uh, this is typically what you'd see in your normal UFO sighting, uh, if you've heard them a lot. However, keep in mind that lights in the sky are caused by much more common things than flying saucers. Tell us a little more about the aurora you witnessed taking off out of Area 51. It was a large craft, and the one glimpse I got of it was from the rear, and it had two huge square exhaust with veins in them and uh, it was just it sounded more like a rocket than a jet I don't know I even think he did mention that it was liquid methane powered but um, there again you know working on the disc technology I really could care less what was rolling around at area 51 but uh, it, it, it did catch my eye as a result of going public have there been any attempts made on your life one day when I was getting on um, Interstate 15, driving down Charleston Boulevard, uh, a car came up alongside of me, and uh, I thought he was just trying to race me to get on the freeway. Uh, this was after I had left the project. Um, it was a white, boxy-looking car, exactly what make and model, I don't know. But um, I accelerated to get on the freeway to go fast, and there was a gunshot, and the back of the car was hit, and I skidded off into the uh, median. And I stopped, and I was frightened, and I just stood there because I thought the guy was going to be alongside of me and just shoot me. I had nothing to do. I was essentially paralyzed with, with fear, and I waited there, and then nothing else happened. And do I know it was a government agent trying to kill me? No. Could it have been a drive-by shooting? Maybe. Uh, you know, so it wasn't, I mean, it was an attempt on my life, but by who specifically, I, I don't know. Though I was threatened uh, before I had left, that they threatened my wife's life and my life, so I can only put two and two together and say that they were kind of pissed at me. In an earlier interview, you had mentioned that they had put a gun to your head. Tell us about that. That was after we were caught out when I had the test flight schedule and uh, I brought some friends out to show them the disc test. Uh, we got caught out there and the following day I was debriefed down at Indian Springs Air Force Base and um, I was in the room with the security guards that caught us, my supervisor and some other people and uh, some of the security personnel uh, yeah, they were essentially grilling me about security and, you know, how could I possibly bring people out there? And uh, I guess I wasn't as responsive as they would like. And 
they got in my face and one of them pulled a sidearm out. You know, just pushed it against me. Have you maintained any contacts with your colleagues out at S4? No, I never heard from anyone other than for a very brief time after I left, Dennis, who was my supervisor, did try and make contact with me at the, uh, the meeting place was the Union Plaza Hotel. And I took a, a friend of mine, Gene Huff, down there and another friend, uh, a former colleague and scientist from Los Alamos. And we did, uh, we saw him, but I also did recognize some security personnel walking around there from S4, so whether or not it was a setup or what was going on or was trying to talk to me, we never found out and we left. It just was a, a real strange situation. I never heard from him since. As we enter the 21st century, how has your experience changed your beliefs? Well, if you want to word the question, how are my opinions changed? Uh, I would say considerably. And before I was at S4, I was more or less one of the uh, one of the guys that thought, you know, all these government conspiracy and UFO buffs and things like that were complete lunatics. Um, I even remember before I was involved there, a friend showed me a little newspaper clipping and said John Lear was giving a lecture who was uh, touting that aliens from another world came to Earth and there's 70 different species. And I remember laughing on the phone that this guy had lost his mind. And uh, I was also under the impression that, you know, boy, the government's all for the people and they, you know, you know, they're out here to protect us and all that. You know, after the experiences I had there, uh, everything is completely turned around. You know, the, the government <laughs> is doing everything but uh, looking out for us. I mean, the only thing they're looking out is for themselves. You know, uh, obviously the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if in fact that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others. Actual crafts and technology from another world. And uh, that's probably the most important event in history. It kind of moved from science fiction into reality in my mind. And uh, it really just, I guess, opened my eyes. Let's go! Whether or not we can duplicate them. I mean, if we can understand what a device is or how something operates or what its physical makeup is, that's great. But if we can't duplicate it, it's useless to us. So there's really two phases to the project going on there. It's understanding what we're looking at. And then once we understand it is can we duplicate it with earthly materials and earthly technology? And you know, unless we've got a handle on both of them, all that technology is useless to us. And and if it turns out we can't do that, all we have is one single prized possession that we have to take care of, and that's it. After all that's been said and done, would you do this over again? What would you do differently? I would probably have played along for a longer time. Um, I would like to have known a little bit more about the technology and uh, probably kept quiet if I could have. Um, and possibly never have said anything. Uh, I almost wish I had done that. You know, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's really only caused headaches and problems. But um, I believe if I was given the opportunity again to go back in time and redo it, I think I pretty much would have just shut up and gone along with the program. I would have much preferred that instead of the Navy or whoever it was, uh, that hand-picked a few renegade scientists here and there, that they turn it over to some more qualified people. Obviously, I was not the most qualified person on a propulsion or field propulsion or anything of that sort. I was just some guy. I mean, they could have picked, I could have named 10 or 12 other guys that were more qualified than me. But, um, you know, if they turned it over to the scientific community and not just a couple guys here in the United States, I mean, you need a large group of people in a large lab to research what's going on there, uh, not a little quiet installation. It's the, it's the security itself that 
prevents them from getting anywhere. I mean, it, it, they never do work hand in hand. You can't have a, a military mind. Science itself must communicate. You have to have a free exchange of ideas. That's how things progress. And when you clamp down on a security system like that, where you work in isolated groups and ideas cannot be exchanged, you don't get anywhere. And that's, that's the problem they have. What does the future hold for Bob Lazar? Well, I'm not really involved in any of that stuff anymore. That's kind of put behind me. Um, I have my own businesses that I work at, uh, some computer graphics, uh, some consultation, um, other technical jobs, uh, radiation detectors, and a few other things like that. Um, so really, I just go about my life, and that's you know something that happened that was fantastic, and, and it's over. But uh, it's kind of hard to shake it loose. But eventually, I will, and that'll be that. I think all the surveillance and everything stopped. I don't think anyone's bothering to monitor me. I've, I've said everything that I know. It's been all over the place, so it's kind of uh, a done deal. As far as whether or not there were any craft out there, I believe you know they were out and gone in probably the late 89, early 90. And the only thing people see now out there are you know, either flares or planes coming into land. But uh, that's about it. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. Army officers say the missile found sometime last week has been inspected at Roswell, New Mexico, and sent to Wright Field, Ohio, for further inspection. Why in the world someone would invest such an amount of money, of efforts, of means and saying? to put together a 23 minutes film of this kind. It defies reason. It doesn't make sense. I cannot relate these structures to abdominal contents. The liver, if it were the liver, should be over here to the right. I'm seeing a mass that I cannot readily explain. And uh, I have great difficulty in correlating this with any human body that I have seen. As, as difficult as it is for me to say it, as reluctant as I am to say it, that uh, what I have seen here uh, does not appear to be a human being. What, what is this? I would prefer to say for the time being that it is humanoid. I'm not going to say it is from a distant planet. What planet? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I cannot say that it is a member of the human race as you and I know the human race. I have never performed an autopsy on any body that even closely resembles uh, the being that we see on this film. There are six fingers on each hand, and there are also six toes on each foot. They're either pathologists or they're surgeons who have done a fair number of autopsies. This supposedly was filmed in 1947, and while things haven't changed, we see some things that would have been expected at that time, such as the use of a handsaw in removing the skull cap. I should also like to point out that this kind of a rectangular shaped, somewhat sunken tray was the kind that I recall being around many, many years ago. We don't see uh, these things around very much today, if at all. Uh, aluminum in appearance. Uh, there were fragments of aircraft scanner, whatever the thing was, and also some girders uh, with pictures of hieroglyphic-like things on it. I took them to be owls, but uh, who knows? An owl statue. While said to merely personify wisdom, the symbol of the owl has often been described as a prominent symbol of the aforementioned Illuminati. That's, what does it mean? Um, it's Sorry, Molly, touching you. <laughs> um, it means a lot of different things, but um, 
I mean, to me, it's what's important to me. I, I don't think it's it's not really for other people to really know about. It's not really for other people to really know about. and priests, I spit upon your fire. Stars don't move. Planets or anything that's like a planet does. So this is color coded. This is what they saw on different nights. They were looking for one thing moving. They color coded it to, to show that all these stars are staying still. This thing is moving. Our solar system is still terra incognita. It's full of surprises. This object is something that astronomers said shouldn't even be there. There's a whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know that are full of these things that are sort of planets, sort of comets. Some of them they call dwarf planets. That's what they're calling this one. What we're seeing is, we're seeing our neighborhood. We're seeing what's around us. And then the second part, we're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. We're seeing where we came from. Mm -hmm. This doesn't add up. Yeah. We need to ask some other folks to take a look at this for us and tell us if we're crazy. An ancient core, and core of a gas giant that was ejected out to the farthest reaches of the solar system thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. What does this tell us about our solar system? Well, one thing it tells us is that we don't really understand it as well as we thought we did. Mm. 30 seconds forward. We copy it down. The goal was to delve into the unknown world beneath the surface for signs of past habitability. A diamond-tipped drill on a robotic arm does the delving. Samples of rock and soil obtained in this way are analyzed on the spot. Scientists are looking for organic compounds that might have permitted life on Mars. Curiosity and the entry, descent, and landing system are uh, revolutionary. It's a real laboratory, and it's a laboratory on wheels. And what that means is we can take it around to different places and study the rocks, and then from that reconstruct different uh, environments that existed in the early history of Mars. However, Curiosity has been afflicted with a host of problems, from computer glitches to solar interference with communications. We may have lost the rover forever. But Curiosity surmounted such crises and resumed its quest. It soon discovered, beneath the famously red Martian terrain, an unexpected world of gray. This finding greatly increased the chance that life has indeed been possible on Mars. Curiosity is continuing its rambles on Mars. This program tracks its adventures over the course of one year. Curiosity first entered the Martian atmosphere in August 2012. Executing thousands of commands, it approaches its landing area. One mistake could send it crashing into the surface. We are in powered flight. Yes. Rover is guided to its target landing area by radar. As it descends, it must skim over a 5,000 meter high mountain range. Sky crane is started. Curiosity has landed safely on Mars. Two minutes later. Images. You got thumbnails. It's the real. It's the real. We are real down on Mars. 
The first image received was the brilliant globe of the sun, shining a benediction on Curiosity's mission. Then, far off in the distance, rose the 5,000 meter peak of Mount Sharp. no way to know in advance that the rover would be oriented so that you could see that but it was it was really great to see the mountain that we had observed from orbit and and realized that uh, our we, we could make that target someday the rover had landed in a giant crater near Mars's equator some scientists speculated that once there was a great body of water here. That made it the perfect place to search for conditions permitting life. Curiosity's adventures were about to begin. the day after the landing. Curiosity raises its head and looks about slowly. It has two pairs of navigation cameras. These cameras can cover a 360-degree panorama, taking 3D images of the surrounding terrain. Two high-resolution cameras are also affixed to the mast for distant and wide shots. The procedure is to take multiple color images, then combine them so as to produce a detailed panorama. From the pebbles in the foreground to the formation several kilometers in the distance, all is revealed in vivid detail. Now that Curiosity's imaging systems have been checked out, it's time to confirm mobility. Mission Control commands the rover to start moving. First off, it goes 4.5 meters directly ahead. Then it executes a 120 degree turn. Next, it will move backward 2.4 meters. Even these baby steps put mission control under agonizing pressure. At this time, Mars is about 260 million kilometers from Earth. For each command to reach Curiosity, it takes over 15 minutes. Then for the result to make its way back to Earth, it takes another 15 minutes. In the unlikely event that some mistake is made in a command, it could be fatal to the mission. In the present case, they've waited three hours since sending the commands. An image arrives from Curiosity. The rover's tracks on the Martian surface, precisely as commanded. This is a promising start. Curiosity landed at the red dot in the plains at the base of Mount Sharp. The rover's first destination lies 500 meters to the east at the seams of three rock plates comprised of different materials from different eras. 
we recognized that we were going to be able to, to study a kind of a rock that we saw from orbit that had this signature of very high thermal inertia. And we thought maybe the water was involved in precipitating minerals that filled in the pore space. That's why we decided to go, because we thought maybe the property of thermal inertia has something to do with water. Curiosity fixes its navigation cameras on its destination. Mars, the red planet, glows in the night sky. It is Earth's neighbor. Could it harbor life? People have long pondered that question. One of them, in the late 19th century, was the American astronomer Percival Lowell. His observations of the planet over 15 years led him to conclude that there were traces of numerous canal-like structures on the Martian surface. Lowell concluded that, unquestionably, Mars, too, boasted an advanced civilization. But in the 20th century, Mars missions sent back images showing no trace of actual canals. What the images did show, however, looked like traces of the flow of water. Even if there was no intelligent life, might there not be at least some primitive organisms? Speculation mounted. What are the requirements for life to exist? On Earth, there are a minimum of three. First, liquid water. Among its many and varied functions, it conveys nourishment to every part of our bodies. Second, an energy source. This is vital for such basic aspects of life as growth and reproduction. Third, organic compounds. These are the raw materials out of which life takes shape. In 1997, however, the Pathfinder probe made a stunning discovery that seemed to dash hopes of life on Mars. With expertise in both geology and biology, Jack Farmer has been a valued contributor to every major Mars mission from Pathfinder onwards. I suggested that we go to the outflow channel called Eris Vallis, which was draining from this terrain of potentially lots of different kinds of habitable environments, carrying water from the subsurface up, draining out and depositing right where we landed. However, when the surfaces of the rocks and ground were inspected directly, scientists were disappointed. The rust-colored Martian terrain looked extremely inhospitable. Jack Farmer calls such a highly oxidized surface a real killer for life. Oxidation reactions are always going on on the surface of Mars, and this kind of surface skin of basaltic materials like this gets turned to something like this. So Mars is red, for a good reason, I guess. This is how it happens. Cosmic rays pass right through the thin Martian atmosphere, directly striking the planet's surface. That produces a large number of active oxygen atoms. They bind with iron in the rock, producing the characteristic rust color of oxidation. Active oxygen has a powerful impact on organic compounds 
the very building blocks of life. It splits them off, disintegrating the compounds. If they're there, they're there very shortly oxidized and turned into CO2. The bleak, reddish surface of Mars. It proclaims the fierce oxidation of a sterile world. Hopes faded for even a historically habitable Mars. But now, Jack Farmer and other scientists are following a promising new lead. They're looking inside rock formations, where cosmic rays cannot reach. If you go in the subsurface, different story. If you can get down deep enough where there could be water present, then you've got a whole different ball game, and I think you could open the door for life down there. Could there be, hidden beneath the arid terrain of Mars, an entirely different environment, one hospitable to life? Answering that grand question is Curiosity's mission. Pre-op checklist completed. Curiosity is good to go. As if to pray for an indefinite continuation of its mission, Curiosity etches the infinity symbol in the Martian soil. August 27th, about three weeks since the landing. Curiosity is ready to venture forth. One of its early finds is a strangely shaped rock. This pyramid shaped rock, about 30 centimeters on an edge. It makes a good test subject for some new equipment. The ChemCam, a laser spectrometer and imager. As the laser beam bores in, the ChemCam analyzes light from the vaporized rock to determine composition. The pyramid rock is found to be a volcanic rock, basalt, rich in metals like iron and magnesium. Its remarkable angular shape is thought to be the result of wind erosion. Curiosity continues its trek through fantastically bleak scenery. As it travels, its cameras record some incredible sights like this partial solar eclipse. Mars has two moons. One of them, Phobos, has passed overhead, partially obscuring the sun. This is the first time a Martian solar eclipse has been captured so distinctly. Curiosity soldiers on, sending back image after image, at a pace of more than 200 a day.
One image in particular catches the attention of mission scientists back on Earth. It was taken just 100 meters from the landing site. It shows a large number of pebbles strewn about at the base of some uplifted bedrock. Very similar terrain can be seen on Earth, dry riverbeds. These pebbles were rounded by friction as the current ran its course. Now the eroded, dried up channel is littered with them. Compare them side by side, similar indeed. This is incontrovertible proof that water used to flow in this region. The first of those three requirements for life has already been satisfied. Experts can use the size and disposition of the rocks to guess how that river flowed in ages past on Mars. The river would have been about knee deep and it flowed at about the speed of a human walking. So when we saw the, the ancient stream bed gravel, you think of flowing water. And one of the things that you want to do is go with the flow, follow that river, see if you can see where it takes you. Because on Earth, when you follow a river, it either leads to an ocean or it leads to a lake. So curiosity goes with the flow, eastward. What sort of scenery awaits it? About two months after the landing, just short of its next science destination, Curiosity encounters a new formation. The rock nest drift of windblown sand and dust. Curiosity takes this opportunity to test for organic compounds, which are vital to life and are a key target of the mission. The SAM laboratory suite is highly efficient at detecting organic compounds. Paul Mahaffey is NASA's principal investigator for these analyses on the Curiosity mission. So this is a full-size model of SAM on Mars. This is the electronics box. This is the mass spectrometer. This is a gas chromatograph. And our third instrument, the tunable laser spectrometer, is, is down here. All these analytical instruments are packed into a laboratory suite about the size of a microwave oven. And in fact, samples introduced into it are first heated at high temperatures. The gases given off by this process are then analyzed minutely by the mass spectrometer to determine their constituents. When the sand and dust of the rock nest site were analyzed, the results were stunning. Trace amounts of chloromethane, an organic compound, were detected. At last, a key ingredient for life on Mars had been discovered. The scientific community was all abuzz. However, at a hastily called news conference, the project's leaders were cautious in their claims. SAM has no definitive detection to report of organic compounds with these first set of experiments. 
The SAM laboratory suite had been assembled in a terrestrial clean room. Despite all the team's precautions, could impurities have entered it? Possibly it was those impurities that had been detected. As far as the first analysis of the rock nest sample is concerned, we certainly couldn't definitively rule out that most or even all of that carbon might be from Earth. But this uncertainty only intensified the hopes placed on curiosity. Soon the rover would arrive at its primary science destination, where it would be expected to find definitive proof. December 7, 2012. After about four Earth months, the rover has finally reached its primary destination for exploration. A new type of terrain has come into view. To the southeast, a bulge of bedrock. To the northeast, a low-lying area. Curiosity heads into the low-lying area. What will it find? A basin stretching as far as the eye can see. The bedrock is cracked but flat, like an interminable expanse of stepping stones in some giant garden. The character of the rock is much different. We have mud cracks and things of that nature that suggest perhaps this was a, a lake that actually, a shallow lake that would dry out occasionally and produce cracking. This dried out lake bed has been named Yellowknife Bay. That ancient river Curiosity discovered right after setting out had once flowed down here and created a magnificent lake. Next, Curiosity will put a drill to work to obtain a historic first sample from underneath the red ground of Mars. The rover descends carefully into the bay itself. It will spend the next 40 days exploring the bay's every nook and cranny. And then we drove up to another particular part of the outcrop where you could go up it centimeter by centimeter by centimeter and do a detailed study. And then we did that. And then ultimately, that helped us pick the place where we wanted to drill. The basin was vast. Where to drill was indeed a matter requiring thought and planning. Curiosity finally finds a target that looks perfect for drilling a flat and stable rock bed. It is given the name John Klein. February 8th, 2013. Whether it's been day or night on Earth, John Wright has continued his skillful maneuvering of the Curiosity rover and he's been formulating complicated commands to operate the drill. He runs simulation after simulation.
accurately excavating the target spot requires extremely delicate manipulation of Curiosity's robotic arm. So when you put the arm out, it just sags down because of the weight. And it can sag up to seven or eight centimeters below where you command it to. When you say go to 10 centimeters, it says, well, in this configuration, I might have five centimeters of droop. So I'll command it to 15 and expect it to droop down to 10. That, making sure all that worked right, was the stressful part. After spending more than five hours assembling the command sequences, Wright sends them to Curiosity. Great, uh, mini drill. The next day brings images that of the is, results. Uh, that's, that's an image here of, uh, of our first hole on Mars. Big success. Yep. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> this was the first time in history that human beings had drilled a hole into another planet. Note the color. Beneath the red surface, gray rock tinged with green. I think when we first saw the color of the rock that was being exposed as a result of drilling was one of the, the most exciting moments of the entire mission to me. It, it was right up there with landing itself. Uh, because when you see this gray color and you know the chemistry in advance, when the iron is more in the reduced state, you can get a grayer color, which is the color of, say, for example, iron metal is gray because all the iron is reduced in that state. The sample extracted from the rock is placed into SAM, the specialized onboard laboratory. There, it's analyzed for the presence of organic compounds. But just when Mission Control thought the data was coming in fine... It'll be hard, hard to see above the noise floor in the FFTs, given how weak the low-gain signal is. Yeah. An unforeseen circumstance. The main computer controlling all of Curiosity's equipment has developed a serious glitch. The data stream has suddenly been suspended. The mission specialists concentrate as a group on troubleshooting the problem. They pinpoint the culprit, the main computer's flash memory, dedicated to preserving Curiosity's analytical data. What's worse, further analysis reveals that after several hours, if nothing is done, Curiosity will cease receiving instructions from Earth. This computer would stop talking to Earth. We wouldn't be able to send commands to it. It would stop, do, it would do no more help for us, and the computer would forever be locked in this per 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 perpetual loop, never communicating to us again. We may have lost the rover forever. If communication with Curiosity becomes impossible, the rover will be stranded on Mars as a pile of very expensive junk. Is there no way to prevent that worst case scenario? Their discussions produce in the end an all or nothing solution. We've got to do something. We've got to kill this computer. It's not going to kill itself. This computer is going crazy. We have to take it offline. So the troublesome primary or A-side computer will be taken offline, and they'll switch to the B-side backup. The problem is, once they've shut down the main computer, will the backup boot up properly or not? There are absolutely no guarantees. So next time at 11, but there are also no alternatives. So the main computer is shut down and the backup is switched on.
The result? We waited and waited. When the, when the minute came, five, four, three, two, one. Nothing. We saw no signal. We all looked at each other. Uh, did we do the math wrong? Let's go check the math. No, we didn't do the math wrong. Now we're very nervous that maybe we messed this whole process up and that we missed the command or did something wrong. Project staff all resigned themselves to the worst. Uh, we confirm we are watching the FFT display. We don't see any signal coming. Three minutes later, doo, there is a signal. Later on, we realized that the new computer watch hadn't been updated. Okay, so so that makes sense, but we didn't realize it was off by three minutes. But we were very relieved. Once we saw that signal, we were knew we were in good shape. Curiosity had surmounted the crisis and obtained some hard-won samples of gray Martian rock. The precious analytical data were successfully streamed to Earth. Washington, D.C. NASA held a press conference at its national headquarters. Project leaders reported on Curiosity's latest achievements and on the possibility of past life on Mars. Yellowknife Bay. This was an ancient environment with the right elements, minerals indicating a near neutral environment, and slightly salty liquid water. Uh, all the prerequisites to support life, a habitable environment. The first step was to introduce the gray powder obtained by the drill into the Kimmen instrument, a component analyzer. Analysis confirmed that the deeper the sample, the weaker the oxidation of the rock. This finding meant that the second requirement for life on Mars, an energy source, had now been satisfied. Uh, it's a battery. And basically, these minerals that Dave and Paul were telling you about, they're effectively like batteries. Some of them are negatively charged, and they have various oxidation states. The difference in oxidation states meant that electrons could flow from areas of weaker oxidation to areas of stronger oxidation. Even the minute flow of these electrons constitutes energy and could promote an environment conducive to the nurture of microorganisms. Jack Farmer points out that similar environments occur on Earth. This is a sample from inside a cave, in a place that sunlight does not reach. But check it out under a microscope. And masses of a stringy microorganism are still living in the sample. It always participates in the, re in the oxidation of reduced iron in systems like that. So it's mining this reduced iron spring for its energy. It's not using sunlight, because there's no sunlight there. It's using only chemistry, redox chemistry. Curiosity had proved that even under the surface of Mars, an energy source existed sufficient to satisfy one of the three requirements for life. We're no longer just looking at a, a red, rusty Mars. We have evidence that there is something going on in the sub shallow subsurface. You don't have to go very far, right? A few centimeters, and you're into a totally different world. And made a model. And Next, there was the question of whether the rock samples contained the final requirement for life on Mars, organic compounds. 
Concerned about potential contamination from Earth, the Mars team had given Curiosity's onboard analytical equipment a blank run to establish baselines. Only then did they introduce the sample for analysis. The result? Another finding of chloromethane. It was nearly five times the amount detected during the blank run. Clearly, most of what was detected in the sample had not been brought along inadvertently from Earth. But Paul Mahaffey, in charge of the analysis, knew they could not jump to any conclusions. Chloromethane alone is insufficient to guarantee the presence of life. Chloromethane compounds are the simplest class of organic compounds that you can find. It's very much on the simple end of the types of complexity that we're looking for. Curiosity will have to locate more complex organics. Undaunted, the rover heads off to its next science objective. However, it will first undergo an ordeal even more harrowing than the last. Up to this point in the mission, Curiosity has faithfully executed every command sent to it. But ever since that glitch developed with the main computer, Curiosity has been run by its B-side or backup computer. If this backup computer develops any serious trouble, that really will be the end for this groundbreaking mission. We also need to figure out what happened to the A side and figure out whether or not we can restore it so that we can use it again if we need to in the future. A new problem is looming at this crucial moment. Solar interference with the mission's communication signals. With an orbital period almost double Earth's, Mars finds itself, once every two years, on the opposite side of the Sun from Earth. In other words, the Sun is interposed between Earth and Mars, blocking a direct line of communication. The Sun emits an exceptional amount of charged particles. They stream off the Sun as the solar wind. When signals are sent from Mars to Earth, the solar wind can interfere, letting only some of the data arrive. What's even scarier is that commands sent to Curiosity could be corrupted en route, delivering the wrong instructions. So for about a month, communications with Curiosity will be deliberately shut down. Project engineers are desperate to get the main computer back online before Curiosity goes into standby mode. So, I need to we can set the pointy angles so to right and down. The computer repair work continues day and night. And we did it, we did it all in about three and a half weeks, and just in time for conjunction. So it was a very exciting month of March. Succeeding in their repairs before the conjunction of the Earth, Sun, and Mars, the team is able to safely ride out this period of suspended communications. After one month, Curiosity is back online, communicating with Earth. Engineers immediately send commands for a second drilling experiment. And again, Gray Mars appears. 
but analysis once again finds only chloromethane, no complex organics. Does this mean there are in fact no complex organics at all on Mars? At this point, one scientist offered a new proposition concerning the possibility of past life on Mars. Chris McKay is a co-investigator on the Curiosity mission. McKay has an explanation for why complex organic compounds have not been found on Mars. A clue, he says, is provided by the large amount of perchlorate found on Mars. What does he mean? McKay demonstrates with an informal experiment. Okay, a little perchlorate. And a little sugar. The sugar represents the organics on Mars that we would like to detect. Sugar the well-known complex organic compound resulting from photosynthesis by the sugarcane plant. As I heat it. Sam detects organics in the same way, by heating the sample. McKay is mimicking the basic process. The sugar begins to melt. Sugar's active. That activates the perchlorate. A moment later, perchlorate to heat up. That's the perchlorate burning. So the activated perchlorate destroys complex organic compounds like sugar. The reaction also produces chloromethane. Right, once you heat up the sample with organics, it's all going to get turned into chlorinated organic compounds like chloromethane. Even if there was a biosignature in the sample, say, some cells, they would be destroyed by the perchlorate. But that means that in a location with less perchlorate, there would be a better chance of finding complex organics. And McKay has a theory about just where to look, deeper underground. That material certainly had organics when it was deposited. So something is bleaching the organics out. And that something must be perchlorate chemistry activated by radiation. So we have to go deeper. Curiosity's drill can go 10 centimeters deep at most. But the side of a cliff might provide a way to get at exposed rock from deeper layers. A place like Mount Sharp, seen in that snapshot taken just after landing. We go up Mount Sharp and we find a place where a landslide or an impact has removed material and we can get down below the ground more than five meters with the rover. That would be wonderful. Day 299 since the landing. Its investigation of Yellowknife Bay complete. Curiosity has a new destination. It's heading off to Mount Sharp. There, complex organic compounds, those building blocks of life, may yet await discovery.
maybe we can find an environment where there's not so much perchlorate. Or maybe we can find an environment that just has lesser amounts of, of oxidants. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out how to unlock the, the code for the preservation of organics now. As a geobiologist, Jack Farmer greatly looks forward to this next chapter of Curiosity's Saga. When you combine geology with the quest for life, uh, it's a whole other ball game, and that's really what's kept me interested. Being able to see through that story in the rocks, to ask the question, could life have survived here in the past? Could it still be there today in the subsurface? It's only been one year so far, and Curiosity has already shown us a brand new gray Mars. Its next destination on Mars is a land whose colors and contours we still do not know. Curiosity is exploring new territory in the effort to determine whether or not Mars has ever been able to sustain life. That epic quest continues. Humankind for centuries. They acquired their name after Ferdinand Magellan's expedition circumnavigated the globe in the 16th century, and his crew used these cloud like objects as aids to navigation. During the Age of Discovery, sailors relied on celestial bodies to reckon their own locations. The two heavenly clouds that attracted the attention of Magellan and his crew have fascinated people ever since. Recently, thanks to observations in the Southern Hemisphere using the most advanced telescopes, research on the Magellanic Clouds has taken a giant leap forward. The Magellanic Clouds turn out to be astonishing records of the very birth of the universe. They provide a unique opportunity for studying um, you know, what happens close to us in the universe. And that actually tells us a lot of things about how the universe formed and how galaxies form. Astronomers throughout the world are eager to shed light on the Magellanic Clouds, hoping to reveal secrets about the earliest days of the universe. This program follows these stars on a journey of amazement and discovery. What is the true character of the Magellanic Clouds? This has been a huge mystery since the Age of Discovery. By the 17th century, 100 years after Magellan's expedition circumnavigated the globe, 
Europe was producing numerous star charts of the Southern Hemisphere. The constellations were pictured as various creatures. A flying fish, a chameleon, a resplendent peacock, a big-billed toucan. The constellations all had exotic names. And then there was Nubecula Maior, Latin for large cloud, meaning the large Magellanic cloud. That was paired with Nubecula Minor, or small cloud, the small Magellanic cloud. Since they moved together with the stars, they were clearly no earthly clouds. They were heavenly bodies but exactly what they were remained a mystery. The first detailed research into the Magellanic Clouds began in the 1830s. To conduct research into stars of the Southern Hemisphere, England had established a royal observatory at the Cape of Good Hope in southernmost Africa. Astronomer John Herschel worked there for over four years. He pioneered the study of celestial objects in the Southern Hemisphere. In 1847, Herschel published his findings in a 450-page report. This is the catalog of objects Herschel found in the Magellanic Clouds. Some 1,000 items are listed. There are numerous records of nebulae and star clusters, similar to those visible within the Milky Way galaxy. Herschel clearly thought of the Magellanic Clouds as constituting a galaxy. At the time, most astronomers thought that all celestial bodies lay within the disk of our own Milky Way. Herschel thought that these rather indistinct and nebulous objects must be extragalactic celestial bodies. To prove that, however, one would have to calculate the distance to the Magellanic Clouds. Alas, Herschel did not possess the means to do that. Are the Magellanic Clouds inside the Milky Way or outside? An epoch-making discovery at Harvard University finally solved the riddle. The crucial evidence was supplied by photographic plates stored here. This is the world's largest archive of astronomical photographs. As you can see, we have cabinet after cabinet, many plates, 525,000 plates in this collection. That's 25% of the world's total of astronomical photographs just in this collection. And what is remarkable about that is that it covers more than 100 years of time, from 1885 to 1989. And we began photographing the southern skies early in the 1880s so that the Magellanic Clouds are covered from that early time. These photographic glass plates recorded light from the stars over long periods of exposure. They enabled astronomers to capture not only what Herschel could see directly, 
but even far dimmer stars in the nebulae. Around the turn of the 20th century, the data etched on these glass plates were processed by a team of female analysts. The position and brightness of every single star were meticulously recorded. The analysts were actively seeking variable stars, a popular quarry at the time. Variable stars are stars whose brightness fluctuates. Of particular interest were those whose brightness fluctuated in regular periods. This was one of the very old ones. This type of star could help prove whether the Magellanic Clouds lay inside or outside the Milky Way. It's a 240 minute exposure. Here we have a uh, glass plate of the small Magellanic cloud, a long exposure which is taken. Some of the stars will be variable stars, but you get them at only one moment on this plate. So this is a negative plate, and we also can then make from one of these plates a positive plate and this one can then be used as a master when you put them on top of each other. Superimposing an image of a given area on top of another taken at a different time reveals any change. If the star's brightness is constant, it should be a perfect match. What happens when the brightness changes? Since brightness is translated optically as size, any variability is immediately apparent. This comparative method, done plate by plate, is a way of detecting which stars are variable. One of Harvard's female star analysts was Henrietta Leavitt, an astronomer later recognized for her analyses of variable stars. This is one of the photographic plates of the Magellanic Clouds that Levitt analyzed. Out of 100,000 stars recorded on a single plate, she endeavored to identify the variable ones. Harvard still has her handwritten logbook. She assigned numbers to each variable star, comparing readings at fixed intervals and determining the periodicity of its variations in brightness. To prevent any mistaken attributions among the countless stars in the sky, she drew detailed star charts. After four years of research, Levitt published her study of 1,777 variable stars in the Magellanic Clouds. In the course of compiling these data, she made a vital discovery. She noticed that variable stars in the Magellanic Clouds with the same period had the same brightness or luminosity. Compared with variable stars of the same periodicity within the Milky Way, the ones in the Magellanic Clouds appeared fainter. The fainter the star, the farther away it must be. In the late 1920s, after Levitt had passed away, detailed analyses revealed that the Magellanic Clouds lie far outside the Milky Way. Precise observations determined that the Magellanic Clouds are 200,000 light-years away.
That's twice the diameter of the entire Milky Way. The Magellanic Clouds were definitely other galaxies lying outside the Milky Way. A large telescope subsequently revealed a deep relationship between the Milky Way and the Magellanic Clouds. This is the 2.5 meter Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson. This telescope enabled measurement of the distances to many galaxies outside our own. It revealed features of the Magellanic Clouds that differentiated them definitively from other galaxies. This is the galactic distribution, as currently understood. The two Magellanic Clouds lie approximately 200,000 light years away from our own Milky Way. The larger one is approximately one-tenth the size of our galaxy. The nearest spiral galaxy to our own Milky Way is the Andromeda Galaxy, some 2.3 million light years away. That's 10 times farther away than the Magellanic Clouds. So the Magellanic Clouds are two small galaxies very near our own. Edwin Hubble, the leading astronomer of his day, described the Magellanic system thus. The cloud is an independent stellar system and a close neighbor, actually a satellite, of the galactic system. A satellite is a space object that is gravitationally attracted to another and orbits it, as the moon does the Earth. Hubble thought that the Magellanic clouds similarly orbit the Milky Way galaxy. This concept of a satellite galaxy eventually became the standard view among astronomers. A major discovery was made in the Southern Hemisphere, in Australia. The two Magellanic clouds together make up a single gigantic space object. The discoverer was an Australian astronomer named Don Mathewson. If this object I discovered was actually visible, everyone would be astounded. It's an enormous arc of gas stretching right across the sky. In fact, it's more outstanding than the Milky Way galaxy. Mathewson's starting point was a research paper written by astronomers at Bell Laboratories in the United States. Their measurements of intergalactic radio waves revealed filaments of gas in the skies over the northern hemisphere. It was a rainy Sunday afternoon and it was quite late and I was just turning the pages of, of an astrophysical journal. I plotted their filament of gas, this sausage of gas, and I thought, well, let's extend that sausage a little bit, let's blow it up a little bit. So I drew a line on this polar graph paper, and I thought, gee, 
it passes through the large and small Magellanic Cloud. The line Matthewson extended into the southern hemisphere from the mystery gas mentioned in the article went right between the Magellanic Clouds. And Australia had a radio telescope well suited to confirming the presence or absence of gases. It was the Parkes Observatory. Matthewson couldn't contain his excitement. He telephoned the observatory right away. The very next morning, Matthewson jumped into his car and drove to the observatory. The director had told him that the telescope would be offline for maintenance that day, so Matthewson thought that at night there might be a chance for some brief observations. It took him four hours to drive to the park's observatory. At the time, this giant 64-meter diameter parabolic antenna made Parkes the largest radio telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. When Matthewson arrived, he asked the maintenance workers if he might borrow some time on the telescope. So all the memories come flooding back, because it's the most emotionally charged episode in my life, really. Uh, the discovery of the Magellanic Stream. Past 10 p.m. It was only after the maintenance staff had left for a late supper that Matthewson was able to use the telescope. Had it all plotted out, uh, what I thought would happen. But of course in science, things never happen the way you want it to. Nature is a very... Uh, uh, is a teaser. It teases you and then all of a sudden drops you flat on your face. But tonight was completely different. For the rest of the, uh, of the three or four hours that it took, every position that I looked at with the telescope came out to be the right velocity and the right uh, intensity. When the telescope was pointed along the extrapolated path of the gas stream first noticed in the Northern Hemisphere, further traces of gas were found along the way. The gas trail seemed to be headed for the Magellanic Clouds. That's how Matthewson was the first in the world to actually establish a link between the gas trail and the Magellanic Clouds. Subsequent detailed observations confirmed that their distributions were aligned. This intergalactic belt of gas was named the Magellanic Stream. The Magellanic Stream is an extension of the same nebulae spotted by Ferdinand Magellan. It's a huge belt of gas, stretched out as if to curve around the Milky Way galaxy. It's one million light years in length. That's 10 times the diameter of the Milky Way. Like the contrail of a jet plane, the Magellanic Stream is proof that the Magellanic Clouds have passed that way. The gas is distributed as if it were encircling the Milky Way. So astronomers believe that the Magellanic Clouds are spewing out gas as they orbit our galaxy. The Magellanic Clouds. Galaxies with a gas trail longer than the diameter of our own galaxy.
to people of the Northern Hemisphere, the night sky of the Southern Hemisphere presents a strange spectacle. There's the constellation Orion. But it's upside down. And the Milky Way looks huge. The exceptionally bright area is our galaxy's nucleus. In the Southern Hemisphere, the mysteries of the universe seem all the closer. This is Santiago, the capital of Chile. It's surrounded by 5,000 meter high mountains. Still bearing traces of its Spanish colonial past, Santiago is today at the forefront of astronomical research. On the way to a green grocer's in a new part of town. Hola. The shopper is Valentin Ivanov, an astronomer who was born in Bulgaria. Recently, he has been analyzing observations of the Magellanic Clouds made with one of the world's most advanced telescopes. He is affiliated with the European Southern Observatory, known as ESO. ESO has established three observatories in Chile from which to survey the stars of the Southern Hemisphere. With his telescopic observations, Ivanov has been creating the most detailed picture yet of the Magellanic Clouds. This is one of the newest projects of ESO, uh, and it aims at creating large uniform maps of the sky. These are called surveys. Uh, one of the most important surveys that this telescope is producing now is the survey of the Magellanic Clouds, these green squares over here. To produce a complete map of the Magellanic Clouds, Ivanov spends a total of one-third of every year at a mountaintop observatory. He has already taken over 100 of these trips. His destination is about a thousand kilometers north of Santiago. It's in an arid zone that sees less than 10 millimeters of precipitation annually. This is the European Southern Observatory's largest site. Seven telescopes are located on the mountaintop here, at an elevation of some 2,600 meters. This is the one Ivanov uses. It's a four-meter aperture telescope called VISTA. Installation was completed toward the end of 2009. 
Its technology is cutting edge. Vista is a special purpose built telescope. Unlike other ISO telescopes, Vista is designed to cover extremely large filter view in a single pointing. The filter view of Vista is about degree by degree and a half. How does Vista compare in this regard to the Hubble Space Telescope? Vista's field of view is about 500 times greater than Hubble's. In a single pointing, Vista can take in a region much broader than a full moon. Ivanov and his Vista team are attempting an exhaustive survey of the entire region containing both the small and large Magellanic Clouds and the bridge linking them. It's sundown. Vista can now be engaged. In the control room, Ivanov will conduct observations all night long. The display shows stars within the Magellanic Cloud System. The Vista Magellanic Cloud Survey already completed a number of tiles, and uh, the data are publicly available. This data contain a lot of interesting objects, like this um, giant H2 region called Tarantula. The Tarantula Nebula is an expanse of gas located within the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's 1,000 light years across. Its name derives from the hairy, spidery appearance of its gases. This image that we see here actually is built from three different images, each of them in the near infrared. The advantage of the near infrared and the advantage of the kind of data that this delivers to us is that we can actually see through the dust. If you look at this, region, at this uh, area on the sky in the optical, you'll see almost no stars because the dust and the absorbs the optical light much more than the infrared light. Vista captured this image of the Tarantula Nebula. Compare it to an optical image showing ordinary visible light. It's clear that the Vista image reveals the stars hidden beyond the gas and dust. The Large Magellanic Cloud is said to contain as many as 20 billion stars. Vista captures them in stunning detail. Innumerable stars, nebulae, star clusters, countless points of light beyond the reach of ordinary optical telescopes, rendered here vividly and distinctly. Vista is continuing to survey the Magellanic clouds at a level of detail unmatched by any other telescope. The Hubble Space Telescope has shown us how different in shape as well the Magellanic Clouds are from our own Milky Way galaxy. This nebula, in a remote part of the large Magellanic Cloud, shines with extraordinary luminosity. It's gigantic more than 30 times the size of the Great Orion Nebula. And out of the dark gas and dust, it is birthing countless new stars. One region in the large Magellanic Cloud is giving birth to more stars than any other region in the Milky Way. 
Here is just one portion. Newly born stars illuminate the surrounding gas. It looks like a cocoon. Here, an accretion of gas and dust is displayed in silhouette, lit from behind by young stars. The largest mass looks like a seahorse. It's a huge object, some 20 light years in length. The small Magellanic Cloud also boasts magnificent nebulae and star clusters. the explosive birth of a hundred thousand stars. The energy they put out is said to be 60 times that of the Great Orion Nebula. Or look at the outskirts of the small Magellanic Cloud. Innumerable young stars born all in a group. And this sparkling, multicolored, open cluster has been called the Jewels of Magellan. Even today, the Magellanic Clouds are far more prolific than the Milky Way in the production of new stars. The Magellanic Clouds had been thought to be orbiting the Milky Way. But recently, a great discovery was made in that regard. The discovery was made by Roland van der Merrill. Hey, hey van der Merrill spent four years directing observations of the Milky Way by the Hubble Space Telescope. His goal was to determine the mass of our galaxy, and he found a way to use the Magellanic Clouds to do so. We thought that if we could measure exactly how the clouds are moving in the sideways direction, we could learn more about the mass of the Milky Way and about the distribution of the mass in the Milky Way. Van der Merrill's group thus observed the Magellanic Clouds directly in order to ascertain the speed of that sideways motion relative to the Milky Way. As a reference point, they chose to use a quasar, celestial bodies that are very far away and so essentially motionless. By using a quasar located beyond the Magellanic Clouds, as seen from Earth, they could measure the cloud's relative motion. They pointed the Hubble Space Telescope in that direction. The anticipated motion of the Magellanic Clouds was minute. It is the equivalent of observing a one millimeter movement from 100 kilometers away. That was close to the limit of Hubble's powers of resolution. And then if you try this with a telescope on Earth, you run into several realistic problems with telescopes on Earth. For example, telescopes uh, are subject to gravity. As the telescope moves, the gravity on the telescope is different, and the instrument distorts a little bit. And you see this in your images. The observations with Hubble continued for four years. Now, we cannot actually measure the motions of stars in the Magellanic Van der Merrill's group succeeded in obtaining data on 25 of the regions into which the Magellanic Clouds had been divided. After analyzing the results for a full year, they calculated that the Magellanic Clouds are moving at an incredible 378 kilometers per second. 
1.36 million kilometers per hour. This was 300,000 kilometers per hour faster than anticipated. Initially, we were just very happy we were getting any results out that said, hey, we can actually measure the motion of the Magellanic clouds. So that was our initial excitement for quite a while. And it was clear we were doing it better than anyone else had done it before. But it wasn't immediately obvious what we were learning. To extract meaning from these speed calculations, computer simulations were conducted of the relative motion of the Milky Way galaxy and the Magellanic clouds. The simulations were carried out at Harvard University. The movements of the Magellanic clouds were minutely calculated using the latest data on the size and mass of the Milky Way. This is the result. Contrary to expectations, the Magellanic clouds do not orbit the Milky Way. Assuming the Milky Way is not unnaturally massive, the Magellanic clouds will eventually fly off into deep space. I basically computed things like the escape speed, which refers to um, the, the speed that an ob object would need to have to escape the potential of the Milky Way at its distance of separation from the Milky Way. And you know, for the, the basic model that I had initially started off with, um, for the Milky Way, the LMC was sitting at the escape speed. So the orbit couldn't be anywhere close to what we thought before. So it was very normal for people to think for years that the Magellanic clouds had been going around the Milky Way many times. Um, Gertina realized that that couldn't be at that speed. They were going too fast. They were basically flying away from the Milky Way too fast, which means that probably they were just coming into the Milky Way for the very first time. And this was a very revolutionary thought. So the Magellanic Clouds are not satellite galaxies of the Milky Way after all. They are visitors from afar, merely enjoying a chance encounter with our own galaxy. In a few billion years, they are fated to disappear into the furthest reaches of space, never to return. The true nature of the Magellanic Clouds is gradually emerging, and astronomical observations indicate that the clouds hold a key to understanding what the universe looked like right after the Big Bang. Paul Crowther is one of the scientists fascinated by the Magellanic Clouds. For 15 years, he's been studying one of the cloud's features in particular. What's attracted his attention is the Tarantula Nebula. At its center, there's a place estimated to shine with the luminosity of a hundred million of our suns. R136 is its scientific designation. It was thought to contain a mystery object. Crowther set out to find out what that was. He conducted his observations with what's called the VLT, or Very Large Telescope, located in Chile. He pointed the VLT and its 8.2 meter diameter mirrors straight at R136 in the middle of the Magellanic Clouds. This is the very center of R136. 
The detailed view provided by the VLT reveals that what looked like one bright clump at its center is comprised of many stars, the brightest of which has been designated R136A1. With the luminosity of 10 million suns, it is, so far as we now know, the brightest star in the universe. Crowther performed a spectral analysis of its light. The, the spectrum is kind of like the fingerprint of an object. It tells us what it's made of, it tells us how hot the gas is in the star. And so this actually is an infrared spectrum taken with a very large telescope of our 36 a one and it reveals the presence of, for example, this is a line of helium-2, ionized helium, uh, and this means the star is incredibly hot. Thanks to this analysis, Crowther was able to start profiling his mystery object. This is how Crowther envisions R136A1 in the center of the Tarantula Nebula. With surface temperatures reaching 55,000 degrees Celsius, it burns bright blue. When it was born, it had the mass of 300 of our suns. To date, nothing comparable has been found in the Milky Way. These first-generation stars of the early universe, born right after the Big Bang, were unlike most of the stars we see today. They were formed directly out of hydrogen and helium gases, and they were all blue giants. In the Magellanic Clouds, there are many such stars. The Hubble Space Telescope has captured a number of ancient galaxies that contain these blue giant stars. All these galaxies are more than 13 billion light years away. So what we see now is how they looked 13 billion years ago. In other words, just moments after the universe was born. Ancient galaxies, glowing bright blue. The sheer number of blue giant stars, similar to the one Crowther has been studying, is enough to impart a blue color to the galaxy as a whole. These galaxies, born just after the creation of the universe, are a mere tenth the size of the Milky Way and have irregular shapes. In size and shape, they resemble the Magellanic Clouds. That is why scientists believe that studying the Magellanic Clouds will provide insights into the evolution of our own galaxy. Well, so the interesting thing here is that we've learned a lot about structure formation in the universe over the years. And in particular, um, what has been learned is that structure forms by smaller units coming together. So if you're a big galaxy like the Milky Way, you really started out as lots of little clumps that fell together over time. One scenario for the growth of the galaxy would go as follows. In the earliest stage of the universe, there were only small, irregular galaxies like the Magellanic Clouds. These small galaxies collided and merged repeatedly. In this way, so the theory goes, over the course of billions of years, larger galaxies like our Milky Way were formed. Van der Merrill believes that the Magellanic Clouds are in fact holdovers from the earliest days of the universe, 
small galaxies that only now are brushing past our own larger galaxy. In the early universe, soon after the Big Bang, we believe this happened all the time. There were bits and pieces of galaxies falling together to form the first real galaxies that then later grew over time. Nowadays, in our current universe, this is actually a pretty rare occurrence. So the fact that we're seeing the Magellanic clouds past the Milky Way right now is very unusual at some level, but it really gives us a glimpse of what the universe was like more typically when it was much younger, when galaxies were falling onto each other and merging together all the time. The Magellanic Clouds had been thought of as satellite galaxies. But it turns out that they are actually leftovers from the very beginnings of the universe. Small galaxies linked together, spewing a plume of gases behind them as they rush past us. At the Vista Telescope in Chile, observations of the Magellanic Clouds are ongoing. The detailed mapping of the Magellanic Clouds, based on the Vista surveys, is expected to be completed in 2017. Vista is uh, continuing the observations of the Magellanic Clouds, and we are extremely lucky to have this exciting in mysterious galaxy next to us because it has been a wonderful playground for astronomers for more than a century now, a um, couple of centuries, and um, it, I'm sure it will help us to reveal many more secrets. The origins of the universe, the birth of the galaxies. These are the mysteries to which the Magellanic Clouds hold the keys. As humanity peers into the southern night skies, that quest will continue.